So let's get started. Bonjour everyone. Great that you're still here at the end of the day. Um, and so my name is Jan Jansen and I'm going to talk about what you see here basically. Uh, so as like a disclaimer, I won't go in depth to any of the tools. I will basically give you like a sneak peek in a lot of tools. And if you like any of them, you can watch a YouTube video, look at the project website, view some other conference session about it. Basically to give you an idea what tools exist and maybe one of them will be useful on your project next week or maybe next year you have some use case where you're like, hey, I need something like this, maybe I can use that tool. And so that's basically the goal of this session. Um, so if you want to see any of the examples, I created actually like 70 examples on my GitHub. So if you go to my GitHub website, uh, no, 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 this one. This one, and you click on Java Hidden Gems, you will see about 70 different tools and libraries. I won't be able to cover all of them today, so if you're interested and like this stuff, have a look at it uh, yourself for the others that I can't cover today. Um, and if you have any questions, please feel free to interrupt me, ask me any questions that you have, or also you can contact me afterwards on Twitter or LinkedIn or whatever you prefer, basically. Um, we're going to cover a few different topics. Uh, so I divided all the examples in these five categories, basically. Uh, so let's basically get started with the first category about architecture. So if you look at architecture, you can yeah, define it somehow, but how do you make sure that it's consistently maintained over the course of many years that people work on the project? And one of the tools that you can use there is uh, ArcUnit. And so with ArcUnit, you can basically define your architectural rules in a JUnit way of working. Who's using JUnit? Probably most of you, right? And so this nicely integrates with JUnit, works in more or less the same way. You can define some rules, which you see here. So we say, for example, that all the classes in the controller packages, which have an address controller annotation, which is often used by Spring Boot, uh, should have a simple name ending on controller. And yeah, I of course made an example that doesn't work, so I have one class in here in the controller package, which is called wrongly named. So yeah, when I check for these rules, I get uh, a message that this class doesn't adhere to the rules. If I would rename this one to wrongly named controller, it's perfectly fine, and I fixed my architecture, right? Um, and you can also make it a bit more advanced, like for example, if we have classes in the payment package, I only want them to use classes from the common package or some Java or Spring uh, classes. I don't want the classes from the payment package to access classes in, for example, uh, let's say the student package or something like that, to make sure they're strictly separated from each other. Same goes for like common. If, if stuff is in common, it shouldn't use stuff from the payment package because then you get circular dependencies. So these kinds of rules, you can express them nicely and you can even use like an abstraction layer on top of it by defining explicit layers. So for example, a controller and a service layer where my controller cannot be accessed by any layer. Basically the controller exposes the rest endpoints that are used from JavaScript. Uh, and the service layer can only be accessed by the controller layer. So that way you can define all your architecture rules. And again, I mean, depending on your example, uh, you get automatically uh, some violations, and this can be completely integrated within JUnit. Uh, then we go to uh, some more testing uh, tooling. So first example is uh, our utility. So let's say you write some asynchronous code, and then when you want to test it, um, you have to make sure that the asynchronous code actually is executed before you can do all your asserts. As so somehow how you need to wait. Uh, you can wait with a thread.sleep and then let it wait for 10 seconds and then check for the result. Uh, like I have the example in here. I assert that something should be in a list, but it's asynchronous because it's still so it's still empty. After waiting for two seconds, the asynchronous method finished and my list is size one. Uh, this, of course, is a bit ugly. If you have a faster machine, um, well, go away. If you have a faster machine, this could maybe, maybe be one second or even less. And if you have this in a lot of cases, your build time will increase a lot. So to fix that, we can use our utility. And what we can do then is we can say, OK, await for at most two seconds until there is something in the list, and then basically continue. And then when I ru quickly run this, Yeah, 
so here we see that the traditional one takes more than two seconds. Of course, we have that thread.sleep there, and the other one takes one second. And this is still a simple example. I mean, uh, you might have even longer thread.sleeps uh, or a lot of them. So this is a nice way to basically optimize that. Um, then the second one uh, we're going to look at is the Jococo agent. Who here is using Jococo? Okay, who has heard of the Jococo agent? One hand, yeah. So that's the interesting one. I think almost everyone uses Jococo, uh, either when you know it or not. It measures the coverage of your application. But they actually also have a Jococo agent, which is a quite interesting tool. So let's have a quick look how it works. First, we need to start our application, and we do so by supplying the Jococo agent, which is basically a jar file. Then I say, okay, I, need, I want uh, to specify the location where the results should be written, and what type of classes I want to measure, and then this is my actual application. So let's simply start my application. Uh, and Jococo, and copy-paste the command. So now my application is running. It's a really simple application with a REST endpoint. So let's call it from our browser. Okay. So yeah, re really simple. So just some car information. Nothing really spectacular here. So then what we can do is we can uh, stop the application. And this is really important. So the results file that we specified is only written away when you stop the application. So up until this time, it's still empty. When I started trying with this, I thought I did something wrong because the file was empty all the time. Then I stopped the application, went to get a drink, and I came back and I was like, hey, why is it now filled? And that's actually because the results are only written away once you close the application. So make sure you don't make the same mistake as I do. Um, then the reports are written away, but it's basically unreadable, uh, unreadable, sorry, um, in an unreadable way, so we can easily make just a HTML page from it. So let's do that. Now we have an HTML page uh, in the target for, oh, no. Um, this one. So here we see our application. So I have a REST controller, and it, had a, it has a get method, but also a post method and some exit method. And the get method, we called it. Huh? We got back this uh, really useful information. And the post method, we didn't call. So what happened here? We basically measure the coverage of a running application. And so you could do this during a performance test, or when you're just clicking around in your application. Or, for example, we in the past on a project had feature tests that covered quite a large part of the application. Uh, those were written in Cucumber. And I was interested simply to see, not really to see if we covered everything, but simply what the results would be. So I ran it on our code base, and I found out that actually a large, some large files that we used weren't covered at all. Anyone an ID how it could be possible that they weren't covered? I think there are two reasons, right? Either we didn't write enough tests, or it was that code. So it was basically never called the code. So by using these kinds of tests, we found out which code we could remove, actually. And so that's uh, an interesting approach where a lot of people are not familiar that these kind of tools exist. So uh, we tried a couple of times, and yeah, we're quite happy with the results. Um, then the next one is uh, PyTest. So who here in the past had a requirement in their project that they needed to write, let's say, 80% coverage? Quite some people. Do you think it's useful? Yeah? So, uh, I mean, I can cover the 80% easiest code, right? And the difficult code is in the 20% that I don't test. Or I can call a method, I have the coverage, but I don't do any asserts. And I could do it on pur purpose. I mean, I've seen projects where I thought it would probably be on purpose because it was that obvious. But if you re refactor some stuff, if you add some branches in your code, some if else statements or something like that, maybe you forget one to test one of these branches. I mean, logic can become so complicated that it's hard to see for yourself. Um, and with PyTest, you can basically detect these kinds of things. So let's say uh, if you look at this example code, um, here we also have some if else statements. And what 
PyTest basically does, it's a form of mutation testing. So it runs your normal unit test against your normal code, so basically against this code. And I, yeah, I have a really simple unit test in this case, which basically asserts if I do these two values in, I get this result back. So it definitely doesn't cover all the different branches in my code. Um, now the mutation test, after the first test was successful, will make variants of your code called mutants. So for example, it will change this um, bigger than in a smaller than sign, or it will return zero here instead of a, uh, the real number. And then for each of those mutants, it will run the test again. And if the test then passes, it basically means it's not a good test because the code changes without the test failing. Um, of course, this can take a bit of a while, like for each piece of code, it can, or for each test, it can create like eight mutants and you have to ru run all eight of them. So probably you don't want to run it each build, but maybe like in a nightly build or something like that. Yeah, so let's simply see how this looks like. So I can simply run this. It's a, a Maven plugin. I think it's also available for Gradle and other options. And uh, this one also generates some reports that you can use. You can also integrate this in tools like Sonicube. So here we see, okay, what, what part of the code did I cover? So I actually, with the simple test, already covered a little bit, but I also missed quite a few things. And why did it go wrong? And so here, for instance, on line 11, this one, my getter, it replaced it with a getter that always returns zero. And so there are some more changes that it made. And you can actually specify which changes it is allowed to make. And that way you can basically test your, the quality of your code. For me, this is the only tool that truly says something about the quality of your code. This really looks into uh, how well your application is tested. Uh, then we look at uh, test containers. And so in the past, if you wanted to do like integration testing, let's say you wanted to test uh, a MySQL da database, all your developers needed to install a MySQL database on their machine, the build server needed to have one, you need to update it when you have a new version, etc., which is kind of annoying. Um, so with test containers, uh, it uses like Docker containers underwater where, where you can basically talk to. So if you look at how it works like, we add some annotations, like test containers. We specify a container. So they have some like predefined containers, like MySQL container. And then I can specify which version I want to use. But you can basically use any Docker container. So if you do stuff with messaging, like Kafka or RabbitMQ, you could do it as well. And then you can retrieve the details from, um, from that container, such as, say, hey, how do I connect to the container? Then you connect to the container, and I have a really simple example that puts some data in the container. Um, and so this works really well out of the box. You don't need to configure a lot. And this then runs on each machine where Docker is installed, basically. Um, and so if you like Docker, you probably also like this one. Uh, th then we go to the next example, where I will actually combine a few examples into one, uh, and that's Gatling. Um, who here used JMeter in the past? Few people, you still regret it? No? You tried to make a report out of the results in Gatling? All right, sorry, in JMeter. That for me was always the most annoying part. You get some plain data out and then management asks, hey, give me some nice graphs. It's like, oh, no, no, I need to transform somehow that data in Excel or whatever to, to create a nice, uh, nice one. Um, if you look at Gatling, in, in the past it was also quite well known, but it used a Scala DSL. Nowadays it has a plain uh, Java DSL, so it's even easier if you're a Java developer. And it's relatively easy to test something. So let's say here we have like a repeat, which is basically like a while loop, loops five times. Um, it goes to two rest endpoints and checks if they can be reached properly. Underneath we see a ramp users. What this actually does is after like zero seconds, you have zero users. After about five seconds, you have four users. After 10 seconds, you have eight users. So this is a way to gradually increase the load. And those eight users will all execute this loop. So that's basically eight times five. You do the math, and that's the number of loops we get. And at the same time, what I will do, I need to start uh, my simple application in the meantime. I will also show how uh, JDK Mission Control works. So JDK Mission Control in the past was part of the JDK, 
uh, provided by Oracle, uh, free to use except on production, then you needed to pay Oracle money for it. Nowadays, it's no longer part of the JDK. You need to download it separately, but you can use it for free everywhere. And it uses really the internals of, uh, of the JDK, the uh, Java flight recorder events. Uh, they can be seen from mission control. So it's a profiling slash monitoring application uh, to visualize those results. So I have here my car application. And what I can then do, oh wait, I also need to see that I start my test here somewhere. And let's get Uh, not that one, this one. Get to the right directory. And now we can start this one. So I can basically start a recording, which lasts for like one minute in my case. I basically said, OK, uh, try to get as much statistics and information as you can. If you have these numbers quite low, the overhead on an application is only like 1%. So you can easily use this on like a production environment without it impacting the application itself. Um, so uh, let's simply finish it. And in the meantime, we start Gatling, the performance test. Uh, so like mentioned, you can use these two separately. I just combined them for demo purposes. Now I can show basically two tools in the same time as that normally I would have shown one. So we see here, basic simulation started, shows the number of active users and waiting users. Uh, it shows which request went OK. It shows some progress, and it's done. Of course, this is a really small one, so it's really quickly done. Normally, you get some nice progress updates here. And then we can look at uh, the target file, uh, target file to see what it generated. So let's uh, use one of those and open it again in a browser. And so here you see that it nicely graphically shows what's going on, what happened in uh, my Gatling scenario. So we see, OK, there were 40 requests to the car endpoint, 40 requests to the car part endpoint. Um, and we see what the min and maximum response times are, things like 99 percentile, which a lot of companies use. Uh, we can also see, OK, how many users were active at, at which point in time, uh, what was the response time distribution. So uh, what went okay and not, percentiles, a, a lot of information. And, and you even have uh, details, which also shows a lot of information. So this is all automatically generated. You can even generate PDFs from this automatically. Uh, so it's easy to set up a performance test and easy to visualize the results. So I quite like it. Then if we look at mission control, so mission control already automatically does some analysis and some feedback on uh, the test run. And here it says, most of the heap was used by only a few classes. That's correct. I mean, I had a relatively simple example, uh, only a few classes. So let's look at some more interesting stuff. For example, method profiling. With method profiling, and this is interesting because the percentage is everywhere the same somehow now. Normally, it differs. <laughs> I've never seen this one. Um, so normally, it differs, and you can see which method in your application takes most of the time. And then you can try to optimize that method first before looking at other methods. Um, other things that you can see here is, for instance, uh, garbage collections. So here you can see how the heap grows, when a garbage collect takes place, how, how long a garbage collect takes. Uh, for instance, in the past, when I got out of memory issues or heap issues, you simply doubled the heap size, right? Fixes everything. Uh, but if you double the heap size, then if it's full, it takes quite some time to garbage collect everything. So it might not be the best idea to basically create a really uh, large heap size. So with this, you get some inside information. And based on that, you can actually nicely tweak your uh, configuration for your heap. Um, you can also see things like which exceptions are being thrown, which threads are running. There's basically a lot of detailed information available in here that you can, uh, can use. Okay, now we come to the more implementation-related uh, testing tools, where we start with uh, equals verifier. Anyone here ever wrote an equals method? Yeah, yeah see some people. Do you think it was a correct one? Yeah? OK, yeah, nice. I like the confidence. Uh, so um, I also wrote one. So this is my class, relatively simple, first name, last name, constructor, and an equals method. Is this one OK, the equals method? No. No? Why not? Ah, 
I see some good remarks. You are better at this than I am. I already see that. So I am not as smart as you guys. So I use a tool called equals verifier. And with that, I can basically check my class. So I say equals verifier for class student, verify if it's OK. Yeah, it's not OK. It gives an error message, the one here. So the hash codes in the end aren't equal. So I should write a proper method. So I tried to make it a bit better. And there are actually a few things that needed to be changed. These ones needed to be final. And this is a little bit more complex than the one I had. So this is how you also write it, right? So this one, if I check it again with equals verifier on my fixed class, it doesn't throw an exception. And so if you ever again write an equals method and you're not as confident as the gentleman on the first row, then you could use this tool to verify it for you. So it's a really simple and easy way to, to do these kinds of things. Then let's see, we go to handlebars. Any of you who received a message from a recruiter in the last month to join another company? Sometimes happens, right? So maybe after today, you're thinking, it's nice, all that technology stuff, but I want to become a recruiter. Huh? I, I will show you how, it, how you need to do it. So handlebars. With handlebars, it's a templating engine. So in this case, I have a, a template basically for a recruiter, right? So make it a bit bigger, then you can see it better. Of course, you say hello, first name, last name. Uh, I use specify a bit of a function title, some experience that needs to be uh, there. Uh, of course, they all provide a really good work-life balance and a really good salary, right? So this is all still plain text, so we need to customize it for our vacancy. So let's customize it from, from Java. So basically, all this stuff you see, the rest is plain HTML, but this stuff we will basically replace. How do we do that? We do it like this. So there is some configuration in here, and then we replace stuff. So for instance, the person stuff, I replace it. And of course, all the recruiters, somehow they don't know your name right, and they put in some brackets or some random stuff. Um, and then we uh, ask some experience. Everyone, of course, needs 20 years of GraalVM experience nowadays. If you do Java, you should also do PHP, right? And recruiters, after like, I don't know, 10 years, still don't know that J2EE is even no longer called Java EE, but Jakarta EE. And if you are a recruiter, make sure that every vacancy has a cool title, right? Because senior developer, it's boring. And so we can basically run this one, and I, I simply output it uh, to the console, but you could output it to HTML page or whatever you like. So here we say, see, now it's plain HTML without the tags. We see here, yeah, right, I'm a proper recruiter. I don't specify a good name for you. Um, and, and everything is filled in. Uh, so a uh, really nice salary, of course. Uh, only work 43 days a week. Oh, you don't even get days off because, yeah, why would you go uh, somewhere else? Uh, so if you ever want to do, uh, without jokes, want to do something with templating with HTML, maybe sending emails or something from your system, this is like a really easy way to fill in uh, some of the variables in a predefined mill. And then we go to uh, Job Runner. Oh, no, not. oh, man, where did that come from? Go away. Where's my project going now? OK, this is annoying. <coughs> OK, anyone sees where I screwed up now? OK, start again. Terminate. OK, in the meantime, I'll simply keep talking. So with Job Runner, you can basically specify jobs that needs to be run. For example, let's say you want to have a daily backup to a database. And if the connection to the database is gone, you want to automatically try it again for a fixed amount of time. Uh, and then say, OK, after three times, like, OK, now I'm sure it won't work. Uh, then I uh, back off. This looks better. Um, so that, that's something you can do with Job Runner. And it has a lot of different ways that you can configure it. It also has a dashboard where you can see which jobs are being run. And everything is persisted. So you could also do this in like a cluster or something uh, with all kinds of extra options. 
So for example here, we have a job which will be retried once. So basically this method is executed twice um, because it basically throws an exception. So this is a really simple example. Let's imagine this is the database that's not available for a few seconds. We can also do uh, recurring jobs with like cron expressions. And uh, we can do a lot of more detailed stuff like, okay, every day plus some seconds or every 15 seconds or basically whatever scheduling you want to do, you can do it with, uh, with Job Runner. Then we have a JSoup, which is, uh, I think, the most uh, tasteful name for uh, something like this, right? Oh, no, sorry. I, I wanted to do another one first. Java Poet, actually, which is an even better name. So with Java Poet, you can generate Java code. So let's say we want to create this class file. Again, simple first name, last name, constructor, setter, getter. Then, of course, we could write plain Java code, but we could also do it like this. And we can use Java Poet to define this. So we first define the first name, the setter, and the getter, constructor, class file, and we built it. I mean, this is awesome, right? So we probably all of you are going to do this next Monday at work and rewrite all the code this way, right? No, of course not. But if you write, for example, a library and you need to dynamically generate classes, then this is really helpful. Uh, so there are a lot of libraries that under the hood use tools like Java Poet to, to generate this. So if you ever work on a library, then this might uh, really be helpful for you. Um, so now we can look at uh, the, the soup one. This one. So what you can do with Java Soup, it's actually like HTML querying, basically. And so I have an HTML page. Uh, in my case, I just wanted a silly example. I create packages to install all, all kinds of JDKs on Windows, and there is a statistics page. page. So yeah, it's cool to get your statistics about the number of downloads, right? And it adds a bit, uh, I would say, maybe not the most structured page, so I need to do some querying inside the CSS elements and in the end retrieve the H4 and then get the first element from that one and then I basically have my results. So let's see if it runs. Don't know if my internet connection is still there. Yeah. So now I can see my number of downloads. And so if you ever want to query like a live HTML site or maybe HTML you have locally or something like that, then this is a relatively easy way, especially if you can control the content of the page because then you can make some um, tags basically inside the page to easily retrieve the data. Then we come to the next one, lib phone number. Who here ever in a form on the internet uh, when they requested your personal data, uh, filled in a fake phone number. Yeah, I do it as well. I don't like to be called. I'm a developer. Leave me alone. Uh, so, what I'm now going to show you, don't use it on any website that I use, basically. Because with lib phone number, you can validate if the phone number is actually valid which someone supplied. Uh, so, here I have a local phone number, a landline number. I can even retrieve the location, so the city where the number is being used. If it's not a landline number, but a, a normal a smartphone number or whatever, you can retrieve the country and the carrier and stuff like that. Um, you can also use either the plus or the zeros or whatever format you like, and it will assert if it's a valid number or a false number. And so if you ever really want to annoy your users, <laughs> you can use this one and get some proper data in. Still, you're, of course, you're not 100% sure. I could also use the number of my colleague or whatever, but at least you know that it's a real number. Uh, then we go to a tool called the Time Vault. In the past, it was called the uh, Opta Planner. And with Opta Planner, you can basically do all kinds of, uh, sorry, time fault. You can do all kinds of uh, planning uh, stuff. So for example, to plan the best r route to deliver goods. Or basically like this, eh? we have a conference, we have a schedule. How do we plan which speaker should be in which room, which session should be when? That's all kinds of planning problems and you can solve them with Opta Planner. So let's start the application and then explain a bit on how it works. Let's see. So basically you define a set of constraints. So if you look at the constraints that I did, um, 
for example, oh, I don't care about that one, go away. Uh, a room can do only one session at a time. That would be a bit weird if the other speaker would stand, be standing next to me and would talk about something completely different, right? At least for me, it would become quite confusing. And to, to basically realize that, we can simply define some methods, like, okay, uh, get the time slot, get the room, and we give some penalty if, if that's the case. Then a speaker can also teach at most one session at a time. Except when you're a Venkat, because it looks like he's everywhere at the same time, right? But like for ordinary speakers, uh, it's quite challenging to do multiple sessions. Again, some quite simple rules. Then a speaker prefers to teach in a single room. If a speaker has multiple sessions at the conference, he or she prefers to stay in the same room, because then you're already accustomed to the room, you know where all the cables are and stuff like that, uh, and we don't like changes, right? Then, I mean, if a speaker actually has multiple sessions, and I mean, it's an honor for him, right, that he gets uh, multiple sessions, but then we also try to punish him a bit to make sure all the sessions are back to back. Give it an extra challenge, basically. And we have language stability. So I, I saw here as well, you have some French sessions and some uh, people that talk English because they don't know French, like me. Um, and you could say, okay, I don't care where, where they are given. You could also say, okay, I prefer to have the English sessions in a separate room so that we can avoid them easier, or for whatever reason. So these are basically my constraints. So let's see, I think application should be long started by now. It starts up in a few seconds. So basically, this is my conference planning. I have a few time slots, and I have a few rooms, and I have a lot of sessions, basically. So let's start this, solve. <coughs> And it's solved already. So if we look at the rules, ah, here we see Dutch, 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 Dutch. Most here is English. I saw something that it went completely right. Here we have a Dutch one. Um, and then I see something strange, right? Why are there two sessions at the same time? I have a rule, right? Any idea what went wrong? I basically have more sessions than I have spaces. So then, basically, it cannot get an optimal result because it has to violate some rules to accommodate everything. And we also see that at the top, right? Here you see the penalties, basically. So this means it didn't find an optimal result. There are some less optimal results. Yeah, you need to somehow deal with those yourself. And I actually found another one. So this one I put in on purpose. So when I ran it, I expected this. Then I found another one, which was quite surprising for me. So here we have a Sondel Max uh, session. Here, we don't have any. Here, we again have one, and here as well. So he mostly has back-to-back -back sessions, which we want to, except for one. Any idea? This one's actually a bit trickier. What I did, basically, to specify if a session was back-to-back, -back, I looked if, uh, if two sessions would fall in a 30-minute interval. But there is a lunch break in between, which is longer than one hour, so that basically broke my rule. Uh, so these tools really are really powerful, but still they execute your rules. So you need to make sure that all the rules that you specify are valid and check the end result if it indeed is according to uh, whatever you thought it would be. And then we go to uh, Apache Spark. Let's first run it, because it takes a little bit of time. So basically, if anyone here familiar with Apache Spark? A few hands. Uh, so it's more like a big, big data or difficult algorithm solution. Uh, you can basically distribute the work across multiple nodes, across multiple physical machines. Uh, so you could have like 100 CPUs across your cloud environment or whatever, and then Spark will make sure that the, the work is divided across those 100 CPUs and that the result, again, in the end is given back. That's like the really simple case to explain it. And so it's more for like those big, difficult things that take a lot of time. But I also had a difficult uh, challenge. I have uh, I found on the internet a 29 gigabyte um, file from Amazon with all the Amazon reviews from their products. And I wanted to parse it and then do some uh, logic on it. In my case, what I wanted to find out was how many reviews contained the text Java programming language. 
And at first, I tried to do it in plain Java, just to show the difference. So yeah, after, of course, fiddling around with the APIs to read a file, which is always horrible, and I need to Google it again. Um, so finally, it was reading the file, took quite a long time, and then it went out of memory, because, yeah, 29 gigabytes, I don't have that much memory in my uh, uh, laptop, or I think I have, but Windows also uses some. Um, so then I did the, the same in uh, Spark, so basically, I read in the data set, I check how big it is, so it's basically 29 gigabytes with uh, 41 million records. Then for each record, I convert it to a review clause. I can quickly show it, but it's really simple. There is an ID and some text in it. For the rest, I'm not really that concerned into splitting it up. Oh, why well, I'm now here. And Then I will basically go through it. Uh, it's, uh, I apply a filter which searches for the Java programming languages. I go to all the results and then in the end check if indeed uh, I get 28 results back. It's still running a little bit. But normally this takes like two minutes for 29 gigabytes, which is quite nice. It uh, uh, goes quickly through it. You can of course do much more complicated algorithms on it. This is just like a really simple example. Ah, 129 seconds, a little bit more than two minutes. Uh, so this is... Uh, yeah, a really cool tool if you work with a bit bigger data or like really big data or, and, and difficult algorithms. Then we have toggles. Any one of you here ever saw a session about using feature flags and stuff like that from the cool companies like Netflix and stuff? They always make it sound really easy, right? You add a feature flag, all your problems go away. And I tried it and then I end up with like 100 feature flags that never get removed in really difficult combinations and stuff like that and you somehow need to manage those feature flags and stuff like that. Uh, and there's actually a, a small application which helps you with it and that's called uh, Toggles. Oh, I need to stop this one before I forget. Um, so with Toggles we can create the feature flags. So in my case I have two features, an awesome feature and an almost ready feature. The awesome feature is enabled by default the other one is not enabled. If I look at my code, my code is like quite simple, right? Uh, I have a few methods. Most interesting ones are these two. I use the feature manager and I check if that feature is uh, enabled. Same for this one. If it's enabled, I return some text. If it's not enabled, I don't return. Oh, I don't, or I return an empty string, almost nothing. Uh, so let's start this one. Yep. So if I go to the first one, uh, the awesome one, it's there, right? It works, it was enabled by default. If I go to the almost ready one, it doesn't work because it isn't enabled. Then I can go to the console, and this you get for free. It's integrated, I didn't specify anything, didn't include any JavaScript, and I'm a de developer, so I couldn't design it as beautiful as this one. Now I can enable this one, run it again, and now my feature is enabled. And so if you want to do something with feature flags, this might actually help you to do uh, some simple feature flags uh, backend stuff. Um, then we go to the more security uh, tooling, because security, of course, is really important. And first we look at the OWASP dependency check. So with the OWASP dependency check, uh, let's run, even verify. Let's run it in the meantime. So all dependency check uses a large database with common vulnerabilities. Uh, it downloads them to your local machine, and then it checks if your dependency contains any of those vulnerabilities. That's how it works in basic. Uh, I cache everything locally because I don't want to depend on the Wi-Fi. Normally it will retrieve updates like every few days to make sure it's updated with the latest vulnerabilities that have been found, and then it matches those against your application. So here we see it found a vulnerability. Maybe you've heard of it, log4j. I don't know what it is. I thought the best result to fix this was to uh, downgrade to log4j1, right? <laughs> no, just kidding. Of course, you need now to update your application to a proper version and fix it. So you can integrate this tool, I think, also with Sonicube and other tools. Uh, you can fill the build if it finds things like this. So you could even in the build server configure it that it would break a build if any vulnerabilities uh, have been found and then resolve those. <coughs> uh, then we have a look at POSI. 
Anyone here who wrote uh, password uh, checkers, like to verify if a password from a user entered was valid according to your specification? Could do it with like a regular expression, but I'm not really smart, so if I finally have a regular expression working and I need to change it the next day, I have no clue what I'm doing. Uh, so for people like me, instead of a regular expression, you could use POSI. With POSI, you basically use like almost like natural language. Huh? So a password should be between 8 and 50, should contain two uppercase characters, three digits, one special character, and, and it shouldn't contain a sequence of, uh, they should actually be three, apparently I changed it sometime, and it shouldn't contain white spaces. So you can define whatever rules that you want. Now to validate if a password is valid, I can create a validator and then validate it and check if the result is valid. It's false in this case, of course. And then I can retrieve the messages. So in my case, it says, okay, these are all basically things that you need to fix in your password. So I can make a bit more difficult passwords, still have some issues, or I can make like really difficult passwords and then it passes. So it's a really easy way. Um, then we come to the more like build time tooling. So for build time, you have, for example, tools like um, a Renovate. Uh, so if I look at, I didn't have it open anymore, my, not the localized GitHub repository. Uh, okay. So with the OS dependency check, you can find issues in your dependencies and then update, but it would be better if you continuously update, right? And there are different tools for it, but tools like Renovate and Dependabot, they can automatically create pull requests for you to uh, update all your dependencies. So for example here, Renovate created a pull request which automatically updates the versions. Then I can simply merge it and it's done. You can even automate it further that it runs a build with the new version. If the build passes, automatically merge it, stuff like that. So it's really powerful to keep your dependencies up to date. And then we have open rewrite. So who of you here is already on Java 17? A few, the rest is probably on older. It's always a challenge to update. With open rewrite, you can automatically do this, actually. And uh, I was never aware of it, but um, it's really powerful. So I can basically run a recipe on my uh, project. So let's do that. And it's not only to update Java, it's, I think it even cross language, but you can also use it to upgrade from JUnit 4 to JUnit 5. And I think they even provide recipes to migrate from different frameworks, from Spring Boot to Quarkus and stuff like that. So they have a lot of different recipes. So if you consider any of those things, have a look at Open Rewrite. Let's simply run the command for now. So it, it makes the changes locally. And then you can still decide, okay, do I want to commit everything or do I still want to change stuff? And it not only makes like the strict changes, like update your dependency, but it also improves your source code actually. So if, if we simply look at the give, get div here to show it in a quick manner. And so this you probably expected, it, it went to uh, JUnit 5 called Jupyter, removed the old dependency, but it also fixed my crappy formatting. And it also improved my code, because here this possibly could have like a null pointer exception, right? Uh, so it improves this as well. And then it replaces everything from JUnit to JUnit Jupyter, makes nice uh, assertions out of it. Uh, let's see, it also, is it? I oh, know I've changed this one as well. So it also uses the new way of uh, asserting exceptions, basically. And so it not only did like the simple upgrade, but it actually made my code a lot nicer. So if you do any upgrade stuff, have a look at it. And then for the last example of the day, who's using Maven here? Yeah, the rest uh, uses Gradle, I assume. Something else? And, ah yeah, good one. Interesting. Sorry, then you cannot use this. <laughs> you might consider upgrading to Maven. <laughs> so yeah, we can do like a Maven compile and it takes a bit of time. like 11 seconds. I could also do Maven Daemon compile. First time it takes a little bit of time because it needs to start the daemon. So now it's six seconds, which is already quite faster than we, uh, than we had before. But let's run it again. Then the daemon is already started and running in the background. And now it runs in four seconds. 
And the only thing I needed to do was download Maven D and uh, make it available locally. You can even make sure that with the Maven command you run Maven D instead, and it's a lot quicker. I heard it depends a little bit on which operating system you're using, how much uh, it improves. Uh, but if you're using Maven, um, uh, this could be really helpful. The downside, of course, is you've got less time to get a coffee. So on Monday, you can decide either coffee or faster builds, right? And yeah, with that, uh, that was my, uh, my last example. So yeah, if you have any questions, let me know. And I have one question for, for all of you. So who already knew all the tools and libraries that I showed? Probably you learned something new then, right? So I hope it's something you can, uh, can use maybe in the future on a new project or on your current project to, to do some, uh, some cool stuff, right? So thank you all for joining. <laughs> Any questions? Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, okay. <laughs> and now it's on, I think. Ah. Okay, so just uh, one question about Java Poet, I think, because I, I had uh, some experience with Java Assist, with, with which sometimes you create uh, the same things with Java code directly. Is it the same thing, same stuff? Java uh, Assist, you know it, no? I think it's built on top of Java Assist, if oh. I remember well. This is like an easier abstraction layer on top okay. of it, if I uh, remember it for, uh, while I read the documentation, yeah. Okay. Because in our project, we use it at least two times. That it's a really, it's a very powerful tool, but mm -hmm. it's it's hard to maintain, hard to do. Yeah, that. yeah. So I think this one maybe is as, as a better maintainable layer on top of it. I think that was the idea behind the project. So yeah. maybe next week we will move to. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Then uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks a lot. <laughs>